I'm Coffee Kevin, and today I, you know, there are two coffee makers in particular that I remember. I, I just don't know why they didn't, why they weren't successful, why they didn't, why they weren't contenders. The uh, and one of them is the uh, von Trifecta, which I think should have. I don't know, you shouldn't get any airport, any regional airport in the country, you should be able to get a perfect cup of coffee from a bun trifecta. It doesn't require an on-site barista, doesn't require, it's craft brewing automated, but it was too robotic for the industry. I actually, maybe it made some baristas nervous. I don't know. You, if you feel that way, tell me. I, I'm curious. But... It, uh, it did a great job of making a cup of coffee to the standard of a full size, like a, a Fetco or a bun, for that matter, uh, cafe machine, commercial machine. But it just made a small, one small cup at a time, or one large cup at a time. It could have been virtually automated so that they could churn them out in small volume markets commercially. Anyway, that's one machine I, I never knew why it didn't succeed. The other machine, and by the way, there's a home version, and if, you, if you're uh, really interested, you should Google it. Um, the other machine, maybe I'll try that one soon. I, I have one. Um, the other machine, is, it's not a machine. It's a non-machine machine. It's called the Southern Soft Brew. The Soft Brew answers the question, can coffee making ever be made simpler than a French press? Yes, it's called a sound and soft brew, and that's the one we're using today. Uh, first of all, though, let me, let me do a couple of uh, things. Um, be sure to vote at Indiegogo. If you're willing to risk $10 for CoffeeCon, go there, get your vote. Uh, your vote will entitle you for the $10. We'll, we'll make sure that you are go on the A-list of people to get downloads for um, any of the coffee cons next year, meaning we're going to uh, live stream um, various uh, events uh, to a select group, and uh, you'll be part of that group. Uh, but meanwhile, um, you definitely want to vote. I want to, we, we've, got, we've got to show support for coffee con because that's how uh, we're we're going to use that to leverage uh, getting uh, exhibitors uh, ahead of time. Uh, I believe there, if if it's not there yet, it will be soon. Uh, tools so that you can buy actually buy your tickets now for next year. I uh, keep asking, having people uh, reach out and ask, when are you going to LA? When are you going to New York again? When are you going to Chicago? And and we've also added as possibilities Tampa and Austin. Uh, Seattle's on there t as well. Um, well, but when are you going to these various places? Look, I'd like to go to all of them. It's just a question of being able to afford them. And A, uh, it will, uh, your, um, anything beyond that, you can you look at the other sponsorship options. But minimally, if you vote, uh, it helps show support and helps me. I use those numbers because I, uh, when reaching out to uh, potential exhibitors, I can say, well, we, you know, we've, we've got this many people that are interested in our show here, our show here, our show here. Uh, believe me, that's what they uh, really pay attention to. Okay, uh, another thing I want to mention, over the weekend, Patricia and I were up in Milwaukee. We went to uh, the Bloody Mary Festival, and uh, Evan Weiss and his lovely wife there uh, were uh, wonderful to uh, uh, meet with. Uh, they've been to Coffee Con uh, in uh, Brooklyn, and um, Evan's actually from Philadelphia, but he lives in uh, Brooklyn. And uh, it was a pleasure going to that event. Uh, it's a great event. If it ever comes around, be sure uh, if you uh, have a yen uh, for Bloody Marys, it's, uh, it's really a, a fun uh, way to uh, spend uh, uh, several hours. Now, let's get back uh, to the Sound and Soft Brew. But first, I, the other day we tried to show you a... Uh, 15-second uh, coffee con uh, ad that we're going to uh, tie into the voting um, in a Facebook ad, and I uh, love your opinion on it, but we didn't have any audio on it, uh, which from where I come from is technical difficulties. So please uh, look at it right 
not. Through August 1st on Indiegogo, vote for which three of six cities most crave a coffee con event in 2020. Taste, try, and learn everything about coffee. Coffee con is for you, the enthusiast. Coffee con. Happy that 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 I'm so happy you came back uh, with the audio this time. I had to had to finally I. I how can I thought the audio was really powerful. Um, so uh, I might be a little biased. Uh, the, the sound and soft brew is what's the difference between the sound and soft brew and a French press? Very little, and yet there is some. Um, the sound and soft brew is this beautiful ceramic device. Uh, it's important to understand uh, to appreciate it uh, the difference. Uh, Glass and uh, uh, ceramic are not uh, in any way identical in how they work with uh, temperature. Um, ceramic is um, is actually a uh, a good. Uh, however, a really both of what they have in common is they're both really good uh, materials. Uh, they have no taste of their own. Th this does have a uh, metal filter, which is a uh, the uh, very now becoming very popular uh, uh, laser uh, cut uh, so that it's got these tiny sprocket holes. But as you'll see if you get one and you try it, uh, it has a, um, it does have a, um, a bit of, uh, there's always some sediment that comes through no matter how coarse you grind it. So it's very important to realize that um, uh, it tells you that the fines are in, in a, even a really good grinder and done at a coarse grind. Uh, we, I use the same grind, by the way, uh, for this that I use for my French press, which is a rather coarse grind, uh, similar to the Chemex grind. Um, and even if you put in 200 degree water, uh, ceramic uh, does not hold heat very well. And so it doesn't stay hot um, very long. And that's a, a, a blessing and a curse. If you really are a person who craves hot coffee, and as we recently pointed out on an episode, uh, you really shouldn't be drinking uh, coffee any hotter than 149 degrees. It's not really healthy, but um, let's put it this way. You never have to worry about that with this coffee maker because it cools rather rapidly. And for that reason, by the way, there's no real, um, uh, the inventor, George Soudan, uh, felt uh, there was no reason to put a, you know, the uh, press uh, is no, didn't need one because it cools enough that, uh, why would you uh, separate it? Well, the reason, biggest reason to separate the, uh, the grounds and the press is to uh, at least reduce, minimize them uh, extracting anymore. But George uh, was of the belief that they really stopped the extraction purposes anyway when it, the coffee uh, dropped in temperature. So it wasn't necessary. And uh, I'm inclined to agree with him. Uh, this I've taken now for today's uh, batch, uh, I've taken, uh, let's see, 30 grams and uh, as you can see here, I'll put this back together again and put this up here so that uh, we can get an overhead shot if we can. Uh, do we, are we, ah, there we are. Thank you. And uh, you can see it's a fairly coarse grind. And uh, are you going to go in on it? Thank you. Um, and yeah, I've got a little bit of uh, lighting on there, but let's, let's, uh, let me remove this and let me pour this in here. And I'm just going to make sure I get all the grounds OK. I thought I had a light on here. It isn't working very well, is it, Michael? It really isn't giving the kind of light that I thought we had. Oh, well. Um, we will put. Uh, Let's see what the, oh, we've got a, we've got to warm up the water just a bit. It got a little cool. I thought I had warmed it up, but apparently it drifted downward. And now we are using a Guatemala coffee. Uh, the, it's the one roasted by North Central College. 
and from Atitlan. In Atitlan, a lot of coffees are different regions of, of uh, Guatemala. Uh, I can't uh, really claim that uh, Atitlan is known, probably the most famous would be Antigua, but Atitlan is perhaps among the most beautiful spots on the earth, if, uh, but, but, but in certainly Guatemala which is a beautiful country everywhere I've been in Guatemala. So here we are, it's uh, heating up quite fast. And then our, okay, you're gonna try. Now I don't, don't, really, I wouldn't, don't worry about it. But he's trying to help me with the lighting. Okay, I'm gonna let this go to 197 or 198 and pour. Even if it goes to 200, it's fine because again, it won't, stay hot for very long, but I never go above 200 in French press. And we have uh, 30 grams of coffee. We're going to put 450 grams of water in. Okay, and now the uh, temperature is uh, hitting 200. There it is, okay. And Now, what I do with this particular brewer is I just put all the water in with the brim kettle. Uh, there we go. There's our 450 grams. There we go. Okay, and then I give it a, uh, a quick stir. And then, can I uh, borrow the phone because I'll use it as a timer. And then he puts this top here, he supplies with it. Thank you, sir. And then, uh, let's see. Okay, and then we will let this go. I've always got to remember to turn that off. And we have, I'm going to let it go for four minutes. And during that time, I'll explain. Uh, I pretty much don't touch it. Uh, I've stirred it, I've given it a stir to get the grounds will have been broken up. All the grounds have been surrounded by water. And my attitude now is anything I do there's a trade-off. I take the top off. For one thing, it's going to cool faster. Um, I want it to stay at the temperature it is. And by the way, I think I can tell you what temperature that is uh, right now. But uh, and already it's dropped. It's uh, 170, 172 degrees. That's a pretty cool brewing temperature. Now that is not, um, there are AeroPress champions who've brewed at that temperature. So don't, uh, you know, I would get off the conventional viewpoint that there is just one magical temperature um, at which to brew coffee. There is a temperature that's highly regarded for most coffees, uh, especially when you gets into machinery and uh, there's a reason for consistencies and time. This is a method I would view differently. I would view it as a, it's a, for the enjoyment of coffee, it is the gestalt, and if there's a compromise in temperature, and you can certainly, I've tried to do it the real uh, the, uh, tight way, and that is to, you know, I've tried the scalding the pot before I use it, and making sure it, you know, I went to 205 degrees to pour it in there so that it would be 200 when it arrived in the water, in the, uh, in the pot, and then uh, quickly put the ground, I had the grounds in there already, and then stirred it, uh, and then sealed it. I don't find that it's, uh, that uh, you get the value for it, to be honest. I think it's better to view this as a casual device, um, and I think you'll, the coffee and you will be better for it. 
that may be uh, kind of an anti um, uh, connoisseur uh, attitude uh, to be casual, but I think there is such a thing as uh, uh, the gestalt of, uh, of, of a method. And I think this method calls for you to be more casual. Be sure to post if you don't agree with that. Okay, and uh, or if you do, if I'm okay with that too, I, it's happened. Uh, 2.55, we're almost at three minutes. Like I said, I'm going to give it four minutes. I think you should give it five minutes, and I think you'd be fine, but we're going to do four. And then uh, we're going to make a cup for uh, Michael and myself, and I think I heard Patricia arrive upstairs, so I will. Uh, she, there's enough here for her as well. There are three good cups of coffee in this. And uh, some people at the end would uh, would stir it, and I'm not going to. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think, again, buys you anything. What it might buy you is a slightly more consistent stirring of it um, to do that. But uh, again, I, uh, I don't even bother with that. I just simply say it's... Uh, an enjoyable cup and a wonderful method, by the way, if someone comes by and just want to talk about it, how things are going. Uh, it's very forgiving if, uh, if you're off a little bit. Focus on the conversation and friendship. And that's, uh, okay, we're at four minutes and uh, now I will pour and of course, the socially skilled thing to do is to pour the other person's cup first because their cup is almost certainly going to be devoid of sediment. And there's Michael's cup. And then I'll pour my cup and then I'm going to measure the temperature. Just I'm curious more than anything to see. And then we'll leave this last cup for Patricia. Let's see where we're at. And you can see it's a 151, 152, 150, 149. It's it's in the it's in the range of uh, of a good uh, safe cup of coffee. Still a bit hot for me, but it has all the everything I want in a cup of coffee. However, it is slightly less strong uh, than I probably would be my ideal. But it's delicious. No bitterness. Um, you know, every cup of coffee does not have to be um, maximally, maximally extracted either, uh, to have a cup of coffee that's, uh, more, a little more tea-like, shall we say, I think is fine as well. Um, you, uh, if you put cream in a cup of coffee like this, you do risk cooling it a bit too much. Uh, so, uh, one way to do that is to, uh, uh, what we could do, what would I do? I probably, the next time I might, um, uh, I might add a little bit of heat. I might add another five degrees on the uh, on the water, and I could even try to uh, grind a little bit finer. You, remember, one of the reasons you you grind coarse for the French press is because you're concerned about uh, if you've ever done this, and I have done this. Uh, I've ground so fine for the French press that I, when pushing it down, it became difficult to push the uh, press down. And uh, that's, of course, not going to happen with this method. It's not a, not a factor. Uh, as far as uh, sediment goes, I'm not detecting any. It's, it tastes like any other cup of coffee I've had. One of the reasons for that is that's a, a good reason not to stir it the second time. Hmm. As it cools just a bit more, I'm picking up a little more complexity that I, I didn't think was there. And um, Guatemala's good coffee for this brewer. A Sumatra would be absolutely heavenly. Uh, let me think. Colombian, very good. Uh, and a uh, nice Kenya 
coffee. Uh, what wouldn't work with this? Not much. Uh, dark roasts, uh, which tend to be air towards bitterness, in my view, um, would probably work out rather nicely in this. I'll tell you what a good uh, aged Java, like Pete's aged Java, which is really a fine coffee, um, one of my favorites of theirs, you know, work really well in this coffee maker. It isn't made anymore, as far as I know, but there are plenty of samples I checked uh, when I was thinking about whether I would do this um, an episode on this brewer because I, you know, I don't purposely want to frustrate people by doing uh, uh, vlog posts on coffee makers they can't find. This one's really freely uh, available on, on uh, uh, places like eBay uh, and uh, seem like they're brand new. So I, I think you could. There's still plenty of stock. And uh, it's not, um, maybe you're not going to find it at a, you know, a Bed Bath & Beyond, but it uh, has nothing to do with its value. It's a really fine brewer, uh, and uh, it was invented by an artist, uh, George Sarden, who, uh, Sarden, who was a uh, really quite a, a clever, I interviewed him once. He was a very clever um, person who had a lot of depth, who just, you know, he he had uh, just it reminded me a bit of a modern day uh, Peter Schlumbaum. Uh, he had a, a certain philosophy that he wanted to uh, uh, devote to creating a coffee brewer. And it's probably part of what's influenced me to take the attitude toward it. I'm, I'm probably reflecting uh, that conversation that I had with him. And uh, it was very important to George uh, that he'd invent something that was um, was a uh, a midwife to uh, good conversation among his friends. And uh, I think he succeeded. I would highly recommend it uh, if you ever get a chance to uh, pick one up. If you certainly, if you find one at a a flea market or someplace like that, or a, a shop, a thrift shop, grab it. I mean, it's just. It's a nice machine. It's uh, rugged. I've had this one for, well, I think 10 years uh, and uh, been very, very happy with it. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, got some things coming. I'm, I'm really trying to get an interview, and I may have to go get it from him because he doesn't like to travel much. Um, with Dan Ephraim, Dan is um, a grinder. Uh, maker. He makes coffee grinders and he's quite uh, knowledgeable and one of the reigning coffee grinder experts in the world. And I happen to know him and I uh, have been talking to him about uh, appearing and explain some things, some mysteries of grind to us. Uh, I may have to go grab the interview and then uh, include it in a segment, uh, but I, I'm still you know, trying to negotiate uh, to have him come here, and that way we could uh, accept some live questions as well. Meanwhile, um, got some other things uh, brewing, and uh, a couple of other coffee makers. I also want to do a, a, another home roast segment, um, and uh, just talk about that, especially since it's the time of year when, if you're a home roaster, you can't help but be outside and uh, try your hand at, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of the backyard barbecue for the coffee aficionado to uh, go out and roast roast their own beans this time of year, at least where I live. Anyway, that said, um, thank you for uh, joining us today. I really uh, had a great uh, uh, time with this segment because it allowed me to uh, sort of uh, meet up with an old friend that you sound soft brew and uh, present it to you today, and I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Coffee Kevin. See you soon.